Welcome, colleagues. Uh, it's my great pleasure to hand over for our first to our first speaker, who is Duncan Baldwin, who's going to talk to us about the policy context. Duncan, welcome. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, as Steve said, just the, the policy changes for, for 2024. Um, obviously, we're in an interesting time gov governmentally, aren't we? Um, the slide that I'm just going to talk through in a moment is, if you like, legacy, talking, uh, you're pointing back to, to previous governments, previous decisions, and uh, we're obviously in an interesting week uh, with the uh, new government starting to flex its policy muscles, um, as we've been seeing uh, uh, seeing so far. Anyway, so this, this slide refers to decisions that were made uh, by uh, agencies in the government um, before the election. And therefore, it's mercifully brief, actually. So it's not not too much to assimilate. So uh, let me let me let me crack on with it. The first thing to say is that uh, we have returned, in in theory, and according to the messaging anyway, to pre-pandemic grading across the UK. And you know, I can hear you all say, well, "Hold on a minute! Didn't didn't we do that last year? I thought that was the whole point." Um, well, yes, we did that in England. Um, so uh, education's a devolved policy area um, and so the, the different governments take different views or have taken different views about um, uh, uh, recovering from the from the pandemic. So whilst in England we, we returned to pre-pandemic grading last year, this year the uh, uh, situation in Northern Ireland and in Wales has reverted to, um, to sort of closer to pre-pandemic grading. So we should be talking about you know up sort of the whole of the UK reasonably uh, consistently these days um, whether we are in fact at pre-pandemic grading is a and you know is another whole other question and I'm sure that's something that David's going to be uh, addressing um, in his talk in a bit um, we've got uh, adjustment of grading in French and German GCSE to be in line with Spanish and this is um, addressing a long long term decades long issue about uh, grading in uh, modern modern languages, so-called severe grading in modern languages, uh, going back to even when I was doing my German O level, I think. Um, and uh, the uh, Ofqual, off the regulator, committed to making some changes uh, during or uh, pre pre pandemic, actually pre COVID. It then got sort of lost in all of that stuff, but um, uh, Ofqual is sort of recommitted to doing that. Um, so, so that's a in, in you know in principle a good thing. The only problem is that Spanish itself is severely graded, so um, that's not quite as good as it could be. So, hopefully, this is the start of a journey rather than rather than the end of it. Um, Ofqual also confirmed that they'd be um, uh, adjusting grading in computing uh, as well. And you can see that in the results for this year that uh, computing has been more generously graded uh, at the higher end of things, particularly. We've got some new uh, VTQs, we've got some uh, new tech awards, um, which means that um, with any, as with any new qualification, it'll take a little while for that um, that qualification to embed and the teachers get familiar with the spec and so on. And um, uh, it also means that any sort of similar types of qualifications, you can't really, um, you know, you can't really track um, year on year, um, if you like. So it's a sort of clean start with those qualifications. Um, not new measures here. We've got um, but, but new priorities, if you like, for performance tables. So we've got um, uh, the number percentage of pupils taking a modern language qualification and uh, taking separate sciences. Those have always been in performance tables, um, uh, but but further down. Um, this is a sort of uh, this is a sort of Nick Gibb last gasp policy change, I would say. Um, those two measures are being elevated so that they're up uh, with the other with the other sort of headline measures. So they'll be you know they'll be visible, more visible than they have been before. Um, universal credit, obviously, that's you know that's that's been around for some time now, um, but its impact and what it what it sort of does to the population or the, you know the population of uh yeah, the free school meals population is sort of continuing to change over time um and it means that 
um, it's really, I think, quite difficult to sort of pin down exactly what that cohort looks like and makes it even more difficult to think about, um, you know, the, the gap, if you like, and what that gap looks like. Because the, gap, the, uh, the population is actually sort of different year on year. Um, I'm delighted that we've got Andrew uh, uh, from FFT. FFT have always been fantastic um, in terms of sort of charting the impact of poverty and disadvantage on attainment. Um, and I know they're doing a great job to sort of you know, track the impact of universal credit. I dare say Andrew will have some things to say about that in a bit. Um, the next one is that level three, so this applies to uh, level three qualifications, level three VA measures return this year at the earliest is what it says is the sort of the last printed uh, material from the from the DFE. Um, I have checked with the policy officials concerned um, and uh, they have got back to me and said we aren't ministers aren't quite sure yet whether they will actually return. It's still under consideration. Um, I think the, the ambition is that they will but the decision hasn't finally been made. I would imagine they're running the numbers to see if they make sense. I think David may well talk a bit more about why that is potentially problematic. So we might be saying uh, hello or welcome back to level three, value added, but of course we are saying farewell, or at least, you know, or, or I don't know if it's if it's farewell or, or um, au revoir um, to progress eight for a couple of years. Um, no progress eight in 25 or 26, as you know, I know you're exercised about what you will do in its in its absence. And I guess our new government might be sort of quietly uh, pleased that it's got this sort of two year hiatus to think through what it will do, if it will change it, um, if it will amend it or what it will do. Uh, we will see. Don't know yet, but uh, we will hopefully find out before much longer. So that's it. Not too much um, to worry about in terms of policy. So my great pleasure to move us on, hand us over to uh, to my friend and colleague, David, who will talk about the details of what's happened. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a brief list there of the, the subjects that we're going to, to cover. Some of them will go into what Duncan is talking about in, in more detail. So if we could begin with the key concepts. Next slide. Um, so those of you who've been to these presentations before, many of this will be familiar to you, but um, for the benefit of those who have not, um, three key things. Firstly, is around the, the average. And I've always used the, the Mona Lisa because the dark green rectangle is actually the chromatic average of the Mona Lisa. And yet you can see very visibly what you miss by just going for the, the average. The next one is that it's really important you always compare like with like and use the phrase apples with pears. They're both lovely, but you mustn't directly compare one with the, the other or, or mix them all in, in together. And then finally, the third one is this notion of relativity. You're sitting in a train, you think you're moving, and you suddenly realise that actually it's the other train that, that, that's moving. And that's still particularly the, the case is, have things moved nationally? Is it your school? Which is shifting? What What's going on? And does an average movement conceal variation within? And that is something that we'll particularly be uh, coming back to and then trying to quantify what is the relative movement that's taking place. Next one. Uh, more information. Um, we all know about tables checking. It has now been officially renamed to check your performance management data. But in practice, tables checking is much clearer and more visible as to what that is. So I'll probably be using that, that phrase. And then we'll be getting the performance tables as usual, um, mid-October, and hopefully subject transition matrices, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll get loads of stuff out mid-October. As schools, you should still be getting stuff towards the end of September. We can start to work things out from that a little bit. Next one. So this is just to recapitulate um, the, the attainment uh, situation. So up to 2019, we'll call normal. We then had CAG, then TAGS, then 22, which was supposed to be midway. Actually, it was a bit more generous than that. And then, as Duncan said, 23 in England, because um, Ofqual has uh, jurisdiction only over England, should have been back to 2019, 24, the same and so on. And we'll, we'll look. I've put the Ofqual um, briefing up there because their strong message is that grading continues as normal um, this summer. 
Next slide. I've put a couple of slides together um, from the media headlines in the, the weeks and days before the, the results, partly to give you something to reference to colleagues, governors, parents who, who will have picked up on this perhaps public messaging. And as Steve said, one of the things we'll be doing in this presentation is actually unpicking what's there. But we can see that it's a message, a pretty gloomy message uh, that was coming out. Um, GCSE grades have fallen, regional divide uh, still there. Next slide. Um, the left-hand ones were a few weeks earlier when some reports came out saying that these there were going to be the worst exam results for, for a decade, dropping right down to 30%. Um, sorry, can we go back? I'm sorry, I thought I'd set my phone. So can you go back, Steve, please? Um, but what perhaps people forgot was that comparable outcomes is in existence. So almost whatever happens, Ofqual will decide at what level those um, key measures are going to come out. And to do that, they do use the national reference test. And I think it was interesting that actually, although English went down, maths went up. And so actually they Ofqual officially decided they were going to make no change to the, the grading on the basis of the national reference test. You, you'll notice that I've put some um, references um, in little green boxes so that when you get the slides, as Steve said, you can actually click on those and Go and read them in more detail for yourselves. And all the way through this, I've tried to give you the, the original URL so that you can go back to that. Sorry, Steve, if you could now go on to the next slide. So now we're going to sort of start to look into it in slightly more detail. Um, and within the context of that gloomy message, what we're going to see is that actually the results in 2024 are pretty similar to 23, some up, some down. But there is quite a lot of little different variation. Do remember, we are still in the shadow of the really big percentage changes that took place in 2021 with CAGs and TAGs, and then coming back down in 22. So everything that I'm going to be saying is about small changes relative to what's going on. But we are that's going to be part of the new normal, is coping with the or reviewing small changes rather than the massive ones that we, we dealt with over the last four years. So left hand side you can see the threshold measure for for plus. Um, 24 is pretty stable relative to uh, 23. But moving to the seven plus threshold, you can see that green language red maths and purple all subjects have all actually shifted upwards. English literature has gone down slightly and we'll explore that a bit more in, in, in the next slide. An average point um, has also sort of stayed um, stayed the same. Um, near enough. Next one. So to see this in a bit more detail, let's look at everything relative to the 2019 baseline. So we're setting that as zero and a few key overall takeaways. And I'll look at things in detail. Firstly, the English language is different from English literature, um, but that's an interesting subject looking at it from a um, senior manager perspective, because usually it's the same teachers who've taught both. So that, that removes one of the variables in your subject subject comparison. And if we look at 2019 to 2023, we can see that literature and maths were similar. They went up about 6%, something like that, whereas language and subjects went up by much more. And that's the same at both the 4 plus and the 7 plus, and then the average point also went up. So we had this sort of clear pattern then, but it's become different in 2024. So let's go through from the left. Four plus, um, almost everything has remain, is now a little bit above where it was in 2019, but sort of stabilizing, apart from literature, where there's a dip. Going to the seven plus, um, most subjects have actually edged up a fraction. 
but literature has is now actually below where it was in 2019. And if you do it relative to English language, there's actually a sort of two percent gap. So relative to what was happening in 2021, that's not a lot, but it just starts to nudge things and people are starting to look at smaller differences rather than the, the big ones. But the thing to note there also is that if you look at the numbers of pupils without any awarded grade in English literature, um, that's increased up to 2.2%, whereas English language has dropped from 1.6 to 1.3%, getting back towards pre-pandemic levels. Why is that? Is it perhaps you know schools are incentivized to enter people for both lit and lang, so to get the double counting in progress aid? Is it that that sort of one percent minority of pupils, you know, they turned up to the language, but they just voted with their feet on literature? I don't know, but, but something to um, look into. And if we look at average score we can see that, again, most things are above where they were in 2019, pretty stable, apart from literature, which has had this, this dip. Those are the main subjects. And I now want to explore other subjects. How are they relative to 2019? So I've picked music, PE and history, just to give us a range of option subjects. And you can see almost the further things went up, the bird they had to come down these went up more than uh, English and maths but they have come down and if you look whether we're talking four plus or um seven plus sorry, whether you're talking the absolute four plus or the difference in four plus everything has pretty much come back to where where it is in the top right I've put the um the English and maths just, uh, just as a memory, and you can see that the the movement there is a bit less than than it was, but we're we're back to the same pattern. Just as a reminder, though, about some of the incredible uh, changes that took place during tax and tags, say A level music, that a percentage A plus jumped from nineteen percent up to fifty five percent, and it's still not back to to pre pandemic levels. So my question was, are there any subjects that aren't where they were in 2019? And if you were listening to Duncan's introduction, then the next slide will come as no surprise. So uh, computing, this was research done by Ofqual, and in light of the research findings, they decided to make an adjustment to grading standards in computing at nine, seven and four. Those are your anchor points, the grades in between are calculated arithmetically. And then French and German is actually the conclusion of the work that was the decided in 2019. Um, as Duncan said, it got lost in the tags and tags. There was an adjustment made in 23 and further um, analysis showed that a little bit more was needed. And that was done in 24. That's it. 25 will be exactly the same as 24. And then 26, of course, we have the new GCSEs. So it's a whole whole different ball game looking at standards, etc. Next slide. We'll actually look at those um, yeah, in what, what actually happened. So you remember the I put some comparative subjects up, music, PE and uh, history. They're the dotted lines. Um, the other lines are the, the subjects that we've been talking about. If we look at four plus uh, from 23 to 24, the purple line at the bottom, that's the computing. That's jumped up nearly five, you know, four or five percent. Um, French, which is the light blue, German, the light brown, the Spanish, the red. They've all moved up a little bit. The difference becomes more visible when we look at the seven plus threshold. And I've done a little magnification in the bottom right hand corner. You can see that the dotted lines are pretty static, but um, German computing and French have moved up significantly. Spanish has just moved up a little bit. Um, why the percentages um, different between French, German and Spanish, it's to do with the prior attainment profiles, the very different profiles, and particularly there's been a change since 2019 because of the, the Ofsted um, judgments around um, a, an ambitious curriculum linked with EBAC, 
there's been a substantial increase in the number of schools putting pupils in for a language, but it's tended to be Spanish, and therefore the number of middle paratain students has increased, which has then um, required the overall profile has changed relative to, to the other subjects. So that, that's just a big alert to people about that. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just giving the overall context for French, German, Spanish. Um, and note, please, now that we're back to the 2023 results, we, we have no official information about prior attainment. So I, I need to go back to the 2023 information. In practice, we don't think there's been very much difference between 23 and 20. Four, and as soon as you get the information in October, we can do the, the further analysis. But you can see very clearly there the, the um, grading for French, German, Spanish um, was still well below. The changes that we're talking about are welcome, but there's still a lot more that needs to do. And it's particularly a case with the Progress Aid EBAC bucket. Please don't use an overall coefficient to judge languages because they, they come off much worse than history, geography, science, etc. Next slide is just defining um, severe grading. It's a historical anomaly dating back to O-level times, even before Duncan did it, because actually it's the 50th anniversary of celebrating um, the paper by Nuttall uh, which first identified severe grading in French and German. So we've been fighting over all that time to actually try and bring things in. The worst thing about all of this is that it means that pupils incorrectly think that they're not as good at languages, um, which is just wrong and change is needed. Then. Next slide. National A8. Oh, sorry. Um, we don't know the official figure. Again, that will be released. But you can see on the left that the average has come back down. But actually, in the A8, it's now a little bit below where it was in 2019, which is a different situation that we saw from the thresholds, etc., cetera, for, for other subjects. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'll show you why that is the, the case. The EBAC, which is your science and your language and your history and your maths and your English, is sort of back to where, where it was. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to highlight to you just how much variation is normal. It's very typical to be at least 5%, even up to 10% in a subject from one year to the, the next. And if we um, remember back to the slides initially, you'll see that the average centre change pretty much marries, marries up with the, the national um, percentage changes as well. But do look at that analytic site. There's all sorts of fascinating stuff in there. Next one. Uh, this is just to remind you where the, the current official information is. It's still um, referring to 2020. Three, as Duncan said, we still don't know what those final decisions are. They, they've stopped doing the statement of intent in July, and we just need to wait. An updated version gets published at the same time as the performance tables in October. Next slide. Um, so this slide shows you how the DfE 23 attainment eight compares with our collaborative estimate for 2024. And you can see that actually <laughs> they are quite similar. So um, using the DfE 23 figures on download day wasn't a bad estimate of the, the progress eight. Our feeling is that when we do get when schools do get their actual P8, it's likely to be a little bit higher than that one worked out from the, the DFP 23. But that, that should get you into the something to the right um, ballpark. But thanks to everybody who helped with that process. Next one. Uh, again, going back to 23 data, these are the individual buckets taken against prior attainment. Note that compared with 2019, we have to take account of the change in the x-axis. The, back in 2019, they, we were still looking in terms of sub-levels. 
by the time we look at 23, um, scaled scores have been introduced at key stage two. So there's a sort of stretch and squeeze going across the, the x-axis. The overall pattern that English is the highest, then the open bucket, then the overall figure, and then maths and EBAC, that, that pattern still continues. But notice that the pale blue open other one is just nudging down a little bit in 23 which leads us on to the next graph, next slide. This is where we're looking how many of the three slots in the EBAC and open buckets are filled by prior attainment. Over on the left is 2016 to 19, and we can see schools are incentivized by progress measures, so they respond. Um, and so the numbers entered for the EBAC um, rows, by the time it got to 2022, um, the numbers being entered for EBAC were pretty much the same as those filling the, the open slots. But then something happened in 2023. There's a definite decline at the lower prior attainment. Again, why? But that's what had the, the impact on the overall average attainment aid. So it's that not filling the buckets um, that caused the, the drop rather than the, the grades themselves were, were dropping. Next one. This is just a reminder of where you can get the uh, performance information when it uh, comes out. And in particular, you have to scroll right to the very end of the web page to find out about the transition matrices. But I've just left that there as a, as a reminder about all the scrolling through and what you can find. Next one. Uh, what's going to be available when? Well, as we said, October, we'll get the uh, transition matrices, we'll get everything published at that point, but that's unvalidated. The corrections you make will then appear in January, February, and then when we get round to June, the cycle starts again, and it's really important to check which pupils are going to be included. That's your chance to say this pupil shouldn't be included. Effectively, you're you're dealing with the denominator at that point and then the the numerator is, is what you're doing during the, the um september checking exercise i noted there that the idsr has much less data than in the pre-2019 frameworks it's interesting that the announcements from Ofsted in the last day or so do refer to um a, a, perhaps an increased focus on outcomes um and it'd be really interesting to see how that plays out for 2025 but lots to play for on that. Next one. Right, we're now going to look at some um, national data at a school level um, from 2023. Next slide. Uh, this is totally publicly available information. You don't need to go to National Pupil Database. You can go to the performance tables, download it all, and everything that I'm about to do, you can do yourself um, and, and see what comes out. Next one. So what I've plotted here, every dot there represents one of the over 3,000 mainstream state-funded schools. Left-hand side is attainment eight, and across the bottom is key stage two in terms of the, the old schools, and put the, the median on there, the lower quartile, upper quartile, and then the national average for attainment eight. Um, unsurprisingly, there's a very tight link between Key stage two input and attainment eight output. And you can see from the little graph down the, sorry, the, the table in the bottom right hand corner, if your school is in the quarter of schools in the country with the lower key stage two input, you've only got a tiny chance of being above average. And that's why attainment measures themselves are so unhelpful in terms of judging um, the progress that schools are making. If Keep, and whereas in the top quarter, all of the schools are above average. Next slide. Um, this is the situation for 2023. As I said, notice that the attainment eight has dropped slightly, but the pattern is pretty much um, the same. But let's just explore for a moment how much difference is there between schools. There's a lot of focus on is school A you know, better than school B and so on. Um, but how much difference is there really? Well, if we draw a best fit line on and then 
do a plus five and minus five, actually three quarters of schools fit within plus or minus five. So relative to the overall value of attainment eight, that's not a lot. I think it gets the message across that you know, we've got the vast majority of schools are doing a good, sound, solid, similar task. There's not that much variation between schools in the way that perhaps people would wish one to, to think that, that there is. Um, next slide, please. Right, we're now looking at Progress 8 um, back in 2019. And what we can see here is that if you're in the lowest quarter by prior attainment, actually a third of the schools have got a positive um, progress eight. When it first started, it was actually up at 37%. Top end is about 71% of schools are getting a positive progress eight. So that's the situation in 2019. But what's happened in by 2020? Can we have a move on to the next slide? So you can see that things are starting to skew a bit. And you can look on this as an application of Goodhart's law is that as soon as you make a measure of target, so I can go back, please. Um, then it ceases to be a useful measure because people are incentivized to hitting the target. And often it's those who have the most resources or who are better placed who are more successful in meeting the target. And we can see now that if you look at the bottom lowest quarter, the first quarter, whereas it was a third um, getting positive progress eight in 2019, it's now a quarter. So an awful lot better than if it was an attainment measure, but it's there and equally at the top end, whereas it had been 70 odd percent, now 87% are getting a positive progress eight. So you're getting this skewing. This is not a criticism of progress eight. This is just using progress eight as an indication of in sense, human behaviors, school behaviors, parental choice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Similar variation between schools, I put the um, 0.5, and minus 0.5 lines on there. So again, you can get a sense as to, to where you, you fit on that. Now, what's interesting is as we're looking at, say, that below the median, um, there are pretty much, not, not quite exactly as many, but a good number of schools are above average. But the, uh, the value of having that uh, massive download from DFE is you can explore things um, local authority by local authority. And I'd just like to share that with you for a moment because there's some fascinating patterns here. And uh, nobody, I think, has the answers to what is behind them. And that's a definite something that would be good for people to talk about. So I picked out a um, few Shire counties, Lancashire, Hampshire and West Sussex, carefully choosing from the north and the south. All those dots there, and I say I could easily have picked a good number of others. I've just named the ones that I, I, I've chosen. You can see that of all the dots with a below average key stage two, virtually all of them have got a negative progress eight. Whereas on the other hand, by the time you get to the top quarter, most of them have got a positive progress eight. Okay. Um, Let's look at, well, someone somewhere must have got some positive eights, positive progress eights from their below average key stage two. I wonder where those are. Next slide, please. Well, Leeds and Bristol are two cities where you can see very clearly um, all those red dots below the average key stage two, almost half of them have got a positive progress eight. Um, on the right hand side, they they are also getting pretty much all of them above um, uh, zero in terms of progress eight. So have we stumbled on a shire versus city issue? It's not north or south because I've mixed all of that up. Well, let's look at another couple of large cities. We now look at Manchester and Newcastle, and we're now back to the pattern for West Sussex and Hampshire. Going with them below average, they're virtually all on negative progress eight. 
high ketones to more positive. So that there's something there that progress age is actually quite useful as I'm picking what is happening in those large cities. Why why are they different from from each other? I don't know is the honest answer and would really be interested in any thoughtful research or, or discussion about that. Next slide, I'm aware that we are getting quite short TSH2 scores. Can we go through this very quickly, please, Steve? Um, this is just to share really for people to take away and look at. So I've gone to the next one. I've just given you there the information of 2018 against 2019 because of those are the inputs to 2000. 2023 and 2024. Next slide. Again, same things looking at expected thresholds rather than the cumulative. Next one. Subject transition matrices. Um, this again is just to show you where you can get this invaluable piece of information when it comes out and tells you how to do it. Next one. Yeah, once you've gone there, you top right you can see you click on maths and that will then show you the information for maths what how do you interpret it well let's look at the the red loop we're looking there at prior attainment in the 107.5 to 109.5 so above average ability it then tells you what the chances are of getting each of the grades and that's those are the national figures and then you can compare your school and we are doing a like for like because you're looking at pupils with the same prior attainment. Next slide. And also, what's also brilliant is that you can do a drop down by disadvantage, EAL, etc. So again, within your school, you can genuinely be comparing your disadvantage against the national disadvantage. One thing I would highlight, though, is that Beware average. Although disadvantage is on average lower, there is still a spread. There's a 23% chance of a disadvantage pupil getting a grade 7 plus. So again, there's a risk of using the average just to lump everybody together in terms of outcomes. It's not. There's a big spread still there. Next one. And again, you can use them to compare one subject with another. That again reinforces the um, severe grading in French. Next one. And finally, we move towards A level. I've put a little table there that reminds you about the input, which is GCSE on the left, and the output, which is A level on the right. Um, we're still not back to normal, normal, because the input was the GCSEs from 2022. At least everybody did an exam, so it didn't have a school level difference. But, but there are complexities, and I can understand why ministers are hesitant around an official measure so we'll find out in a month's time what they've decided and the last couple of slides steve um just looking at numbers here just to remind people that we're going through the growth again from the the low point in 2020 and then it will all start to go back down again so there's going to be need to be a boom in sixth form provision but it's only a temporary one, so it's important that it's dealt with. And also the number of people coming through who might be interested in teaching will be going up as the number of pupils drops, but that's about five years away. Next one, and finally, this is just looking at the proportions of people taking A-levels out of the um, cohort, because there was a feeling in, say, 2022, that perhaps students have stayed on at school or stayed in sixth form college because there was less out there. Now, we're in 2024, we're starting to see a lower percentage starting to go back to pre-pandemic as things more generally start to get back to normal. And that's it from me, I think. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, David. As always, a huge amount um, in there. Really appreciative of that, um, of, of all your input. And it's going through a pace here without me, and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I'm going to see mm -hmm. if I can do something in a moment. I don't know if it's automated, Andrew. Um, so uh, I will try and get to the bottom of why my slides are moving on mysteriously. While I introduce next up uh, is uh, Andrew, who, uh, Andrew Hill, who's the Head of Academy Trust Partnerships at FFT. We're really delighted to have you here with us, Andrew. Uh, and I'm going to try and tame this wild beast before it, it rolls off into the distance. But thank you for coming along and adding to this session today, Andrew. 
we're going the wrong direction. Hi everyone. Anyway, um, I'll I'll make a start. It's really good to uh, be with you all and see you again for this academic year. Um, I'm going to really continue the theme I've been speaking to many of you about um, uh, last year, which is looking particularly at disadvantaged pupils. Obviously, in FFT, we break down, go below the level of the headline results here, and in particular last year, as well as disadvantaged. We were looking at other vulnerable pupils, SEN, the relationship between um, SEN and disadvantage, the relationship, ah, oh, there we go, the relationship between um, other key pupil groups, um, gender and exclusions and things like that. All of that stuff is to come over the next sort of term or so. So look out for us either at CST events or, or at FFT, and I'll, I'll elaborate on a little bit more of that. However, this afternoon I was asked to come along and flag uh, where we are with our disadvantaged pupils, with our early um, headlines here. So, Steve, if we can move on. Oh, there we go, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you'd already moved on. Apologies. <laughs> um, so we, as well as using the historic data sets from previous years, and obviously we'll talk more about those when they're updated uh, later this, this term, um, we're able to pull on all of your schools that have been using the early results uh, service on our, our um, pupil tracking uh, platform. And what we've been able to do this year is take those results, but also match them back to 1,600 schools who submitted results last year as well. So we've got an interesting match of, uh, of data there um, for you. So what does this look like for us in terms of our disadvantaged pupils, Steve? <clears throat> so the headline we've, we've got going here is the grade four and above. And just to explain the chart really quickly, on one side, we've got the sort of official uh, sort of DFE view um, of the data. Um, and you can see we've had a number of years where I've been talking about that gap widening. Um, <clears throat> we then match it to um, last year's early results service. So you can see a slight shift and difference in that cohort um, to just give it context. But then a really important closing of the gap based on our initial analysis on that. I'll, I'll come in with the, the caveats Duncan started to mention at the start, um, at the end of my piece. Um, so that's grade four and above. At time and eight, we're seeing a very uh, similar pattern there. So for our non-disadvantaged, we've got 50.4 um, down, down a little bit in terms of, of that. Um, but our disadvantaged pupils um, are up a little bit there. So a narrowing of the gap we're seeing. Now, what does that look like now for our matched uh, data? So the next slide <clears throat> illustrates our view of where that would be in terms of progress eight here. Um, so obviously plenty of gaps on one side. Um, again, the comparison of the... Uh, Two, two columns, two 2023 20, columns there. But again, in terms of progress, you can see that uh, the gap's narrowing, partly by non-disadvantaged pupils falling back, and of course, um, disadvantaged pupils progressing a little bit more. We're only talking of a small gap. Um, we're talking about very small narrowing of the gap, sorry, you know, only one twentieth of a grade. But it is the first time that's happened for, for well, certainly from what I remember. Um, so that's sort of our headline view. Now, obviously, there's a lot more uh, to that and other interactions that are going on uh, with disadvantaged pupils um, as well. And they belong to other groups. And we've, I know in the chat, people have been talking about EAL. Um, I'm sure we can talk about SCN, D as well. If we could just move on and look at the next slide. <clears throat> so just to sort of give you the visibility at the subject level, and again, I can unpack this more at another time, but you can see how that gap is closing right across those sort of top level subject buckets um, in there for you. Um, if you want to spend a little bit more time, obviously look at the Education Data Lab blogs. We've uh, 
um, one of my colleagues has already released um, information around the, these gaps there for you. So you can uh, see that. Um, it's ending up that the gap is just over a grade, a grade and a quarter. Um, we're now talking about in 2024. And um, the next slide um, sort of probably sort of puts some context around that and produces the caveats for us. <laughs> so the profile of the private payment profile based on um, the results that have been given to us over the last two years um, on the FFT platform, um, you can we can see that the prior attainment profile has changed. We've got more pupils with a higher prior attainment um, coming through there. Um, so that's obviously going to be an interesting fact as we we start to unravel these these results. Um, <clears throat> that obviously means that um, the uh, higher ability key stage two pupils. You know, they're achieving lower attainment eight scores uh, compared to 2023. And then just really finally, just I want to end on the comment um, about like for like really here. There's been some changes as well as um, um, the in diff a different way of measuring um, disadvantaged free school meals, uh, the criteria for free school meals pupils using universal credit. Um, we've obviously also got the the change for this year to do with the um, cohort as well. So really we're dealing with FSM 7 um, at this point. So it's it's a slight uh, movable beast. Um, obviously we'll talk more about this uh, when we've got more time um, and we will start to unpack the rest of the results, um, other key groups, um, gender, EAL, um, other factors like that um, as we go through the rest of the term. So I look forward to um, speaking to you or, or many of you at a later point. Um, thank you, Steve. Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, really, really, really helpful. It's lovely to be able to bring in our partners to support this session and to add uh, that other additional insight that you've gotten. So thank you for that. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, which is Aidan who is Senior Project Manager, uh, Product Manager at Arbor. Aidan, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'll try to be as quick as possible because I know we're trying, trying to get some Q&A at the end of this. Uh, I've, I've just included this slide just to kind of in, uh, showcase kind of what Arbor is doing and what we're trying to do. And we're trying to transform the way schools work for the better. That's through many different tools. In terms, and one of the ways that we do that is through partnerships with the likes of CST. Um, if you could just move on for me. We don't need this slide. We've introduced me. <laughs> Perfect. So as part of um, the data drop blog series that we've been posting, um, we've been doing an analysis on on the Arbor data sets that we have, which represents about 26% of secondaries at the minute. One of the key things that we found in some of our data drop blogs has been that year 11 attendance is below national average. And again, working in partnership with, uh, with David and Duncan and stuff like that, we started to question what was the actual what was the actual impact of that on results? And if we break that down a bit further, what did that do? Um, so if we just move on to the next slide for me. So in 2024 results sets, um, as you can see, we've broken the we've broken the data down by individual subjects. And we've also then got the open subjects at the very end there. The key things that this is showing for us is, as expected, students who attend more do get better. But what is the actual gap here? And it shows that maths and science are particularly impacted by attendance. Um, there is a gap of 1.3 uh, points here, which is quite high in terms of when you look at students who are persistent absentees versus non-persistent absentees. Um, similarly, open the, the open subject had uh, seemed to have less disruption here. So the flexible nature of this subject, does it make it less susceptible to negative effects on attendance and stuff like that? Uh, and then on the next slide, uh, and that kind of is mirrored again with the 2023 results. Um, how did that affect the attendance? Maths and science, again, exhibited the largest disparities, showing the attendance gap to be crucial here. Humanities also showed a marked difference this year. Um, in 2023, it was obviously closed this year. What were some of the interventions that were put in place there and how did things work? And as you can see, overall, the 2023 data in, indicates that 
greater impact on attendance on the academic performance. So again, the focus that's been put on already for attendance in the 24 academic year, what has that had what that has shown to have an impact here? And we can see that already. The key takeaways for us uh, on this, just so everyone's aware, like we know regular attendance is crucial and we support in that as much as we can. Maths and science seem to be particularly impacted here. Early interventions and continued tracking. So as a proactive measure to help address attendance, do we want to then look at maybe introducing some other subjects, uh, interventions here for maths and science? And then also the DfE policies are helping to bring this. So any statutory changes that have come into place since the 19th should provide a framework for to help us improve things here. As a side note, I have included the 22 and 21 uh, charts here for everybody, just so just so a bit more of a continued analysis, but I'm just wary that we have a bit of time. Um, the other thing just to say is this this will likely be part of a themed blog series that we will have on the ARB website, so please keep an eye out for that. Aidan, thank you so much. Um, colleagues, uh, I did say I would try and leave some time at the end for questions, uh, and probably largely as a result of me being unable to work a PowerPoint, it turns out. Um, we don't have uh, quite as much time as perhaps I'd initially thought. But what I thought I might do, we'll take, there are a couple of questions that I'll throw to colleagues uh, in a moment. But um, just while I'm doing that, I did mention at the start, if you've got questions uh, of your own, please do pop them into the chat. And what I'll do is after the session, I'll work with Duncan, David, Andrew and Aidan to see if we can answer those questions uh, and uh, get you some responses that perhaps we might put, for example, in our uh, data leaders community. So please do pop those in the chat. Uh, in terms of PowerPoint and video, we will make all that stuff available to you. I think the plan is to put that in our community channels. Uh, so uh, particularly in the data leaders one, it will be in there, I imagine, but probably in the school improvement one as well. Uh, and so keep an eye out and we'll notify you and sort of uh, let you know through our community platform when that stuff is available. The question that I thought I might just ask colleagues to talk about if they've got more to, oh, I can see Andy saying, how do we get access to the data leaders channels? That's a great question. If you go onto the website and look at the community section of our website, it will show you in there how to uh, access our community. If you're not already part uh, this is a great stimulus, I hope, to get you into that uh, into that conversation. But the question we've got is, what is the regional uh, PP gap? Have we got anything, colleagues, on regional PP yet? Or is it too early to say? I don't know if anyone wants to come in and uh, just quickly give us a steer on that. We should have something fairly shortly. Great. And it, what's that like to look like, Andrew? Do you think that will, is, is that something that FFT is going to produce as a, a, a blog? Is that a data lab thing? We have started to look at some regional um, analysis. Um, I think we put something out on that. Uh, return in, in terms of disadvantaged, that'd be something uh, to come when we when we look at the next data set coming through. But it's something I, we talked about a lot last year on the 2023. So we'll definitely pick it up during the course of the year for 2024. Um, and it starts getting quite revealing. And And when you combine it with other factors like SEND, EAL, you can start to see some of the local variation and variation between schools coming through. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And David, you pop your hand up. Come on in. Yeah, it was really just to add for more, more widely to have it known that um, questions like that, you, you really need to be getting to the National Pupil Database and or, no organisation is allowed to access that until the performance tables are published in mid-October. I think that's right, Andrew. You'll, that's when you'll get first get access to that. So, really, until then, anything that needs pupil level information is, is very difficult to get hold of. And as I say, as soon as it comes out, then the researchers can start getting into the National Pupil Days, which I think one or two other questions we're asking around that. The answer is we don't know until until that new National Pupil Database becomes available. Really helpful. Thank you very much. OK, so, uh, colleagues, that was our q and I guess we're pretty much at time. So uh, the good thing I can say is hopefully, like if you're like me, um, I'll need some take up time before I probably even know what the, what the right questions are. There's an awful lot to absorb there. So we'll share the slides with you. We'll share the recording with you. Watch it, ba watch it back. Engage again with the slides. Uh, and then uh, obviously we'll process the questions that you've shared in the chat already today. But if there's anything else, then please email us. 
uh, drop it into the community platform. We'll collate those questions. And as I say, we'll work with colleagues on the call today to uh, come up with some answers for you. But as David's already uh, and, and, and Andrew just explained to us, this is a moving feast and we will know more and we'll be able to answer these questions more fully as we uh, obviously get uh, more access to more detailed pupil level data. For now, uh, I'm simply going to say a huge thank you to, to Duncan, to David, to Andrew, to Aidan uh, for their presentations. And also a massive thank you, of course, to all of you for coming along and being part of this session today. If you're tuning in for our trustees and governors session, uh, which is coming up in half an hour, you can have a little break, maybe a cup of tea, uh, recharge the batteries and come back ready for that. Uh, it's going to be a different sort of conversation. We're not going to be getting into the same, quite the same level of uh, detail that we've just got into in this session. It's going to be more looking at sort of headline data, key messages, things for boards to think about at a slightly more strategic level. Uh, and my wonderful colleague, Samira, is going to be leading that conversation. So uh, if you're tuning back in, I'll see you in half an hour. Uh, it's a different link for that meeting, I believe. So just check, check that, uh, which you should have received through the briefings. Uh, otherwise, um, I wish you all a good rest of your Wednesday. Thank you everyone very much and I'll see you soon. Thank you.